we want patients and families to understand that there's some limitations to what we can do. And everybody comes to me and says, can I be cured? And I always think to myself, golly, what's the definition of cancer cure? Cancer cure means you die of something else because some cancers you die with, some cancers you die from. And it's our job as cancer physicians and cancer coaches, if you will, is to guide patients and their families through that process. Hi, listeners. On this episode, we are talking with surgical oncologist, Dr. Martin Heslin. He's the director of the USA Health Mitchell Cancer Institute. And we have a candid and personal conversation about what it means to cure cancer, the future of cancer treatment, and the importance of relationships throughout the cancer journey. Cancer is just something that we all have to recognize, acknowledge, cope with, live with, struggle with, rage upon, crush, and even thrive with. This show is more than knowing and fighting or beating cancer. It's more than just relaying science, hope, and technology. Together, our purpose is to demystify cancer, take away as much fear out of the diagnosis, treatment, and process as we can, defeat its grip on our lives. This is The Cancering Show. Dr. Heslin, welcome to The Cancering Show. I'm excited to be here. Tell us what brought you to Mobile and the Mitchell Cancer Institute. Well, the story starts uh, back in uh, New York. My uh, wife and I never lived outside New York State before we moved to Birmingham in 1996. So from zero to 36 years of age, I was in New York State. From 36 to 59, I worked at UAB in the Department of Surgery. And from 59 to (laughs) 59.3, I'm in Mobile, Alabama at the Mitchell Cancer Institute and couldn't be happier to be here. Awesome. And what took you to Birmingham originally in the cancer specialty? Well, when I was in New York looking for a job, my boss said, opportunity exists for those who are not geographically paralyzed. And so I went back to my wife and I told her that. And she goes, geographically paralyzed? What are you talking about? I'm from Long Island. You're from Westchester. We've lived eight places in New York City. That's not geographically paralyzed. And I said, no, I mean bigger. And so we uh, ended up in a... uh, a new land, and we were there, raised three boys there, and it, it's been great. Awesome. And for you, what drew you to the cancer field specifically? Like all previous moderately successful athletes, I thought I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. And then I got to medical school, and I decided that when you take a sternal saw and saw somebody's sternum open and see their beating heart, I needed to be a cardiac surgeon. And then when I was in New York, I worked at Sloan Kettering and decided that cancer biology and taking care of cancer patients was going to be my passion. I was going to do that around cancer surgery because it gave me the opportunity to have relationships with people. It gave me the opportunity to understand biology, and it allowed me to operate in many different places in the body because in some senses. We go into specialties that are around organ-based or regions like head and neck or thoracic or things like that. But if cancer is your denominator, then I could work in many different places. And so I found myself being in uh, GI cancer, so mostly stomach, liver, pancreas, colon, rectum, and then some other specialty things that cancer surgeons do. Now, cancer surgery can sometimes be seen as the more impersonal. How does cancer to you really get personal? Because it's educating the patient and the family. And when it comes right down to it, when I think of surgical oncology, it's a triangle. And this is where the absolute exciting piece about surgical oncology is, or any really the cancer specialties. If you think about the biology of cancer, you need to understand the differences between a slow-growing tumor and a fast-growing tumor and how that applies to the comorbidities of the patient, because some patients are sick and some patients are not sick. And then lastly, it's tying in the technical aspects of the operation, and do you think you can accomplish it safely? And when you take those three things and you take the dot and move it into the middle of those three things, then you perform a safe operation, because everybody can be cured of cancer, but it's the quality of life that we give to people afterwards and educating them on the balance between cancer cure and functional preservation. And that's how you develop relationships with people is discussing these, you know, really, it's not intricate, but it is revealing to the patient and the family and helping them make informed decisions. 
Yeah, I think that's so hard. Like you said, almost anybody can have a surgery performed on them, but doing it safely. And, you know, what I always learned in in my surgical career, choosing the correct patients to operate on and and the patients to not operate on is where the real uh, skill is. I was just talking with the chief residents in the uh, operating room this morning, and we had that exact discussion. As a resident, you learn what to do. As an attending, you learn what not to do. And this helps gu- and guiding people and educating them on how to actually help people understand that. Because everybody's told, go get an operation because you can be cured. Well, the caveat is, go get an operation because you can be cured, open parentheses, if it makes sense for the biology of the tumor and you're not going to leave any cancer behind and still have good quality of life. Right. It's so hard sometimes to really explain to the patient and their family that a surgery is not the answer. Those are, I think, some of the hardest conversations that we have. I tell residents all the time, when somebody comes referred for an operation and I think they should have an operation, the conversation takes five minutes because we are aligned. When someone comes for an operation and they don't need an operation, it takes 45 minutes because we're not aligned. And then you really have to educate people on the same thing the biology of cancer, your comorbidities, and then the technical aspects. And that takes time. But the patients and the families deserve our time when it comes down to understanding all the facets of an operation. It's easy to walk in and tell everybody they need an operation. It's really hard but appropriate to tell people that no, an operation's not the right answer. But that doesn't mean you have no options. It just means that surgery is not plan A. I think those are the challenges, but those are the rewards that you get because people really appreciate the time it takes to explain things to them, draw it in a picture, and then they get it that it might not be appropriate. But by the same token, we're there to take a risk on people when we need to because it is the right answer. Absolutely. And we were talking before we started the show about the reward of these relationships that you build with the patients over time, whether that's at diagnosis or Mm. even more so um, in end-of-life conversations. It is. And I want to be the patient and the family's greatest advocate to put your cape on, go in and, you know, save the day, do the big operation and and cure some people from what's a, a challenging disease. But it's also about the relationship. And so I, I would just tell you a couple things that uh, one of the things I did was ask patients when they got around towards the end of their life, what's important, and to write me a letter about what's important. And you can't believe how hard it is for people to actually sit and write that letter. And one of my patients, I went to visit him when he was in hospice, and, and he apologized. He said, hey, Marty, I never got to write your letter. and But he said, I'll tell you it because it would only have been one sentence long. I was like, gosh, Jim, how can you remember that? And he goes, listen, it's just one sentence. I may be dying, but it's just one sentence. And that is, I think people would be a lot better off if they actually didn't take themselves so seriously, laughed at themselves a little bit, and realized it's going to be okay. Everything is not the end of the world. I really appreciate that, particularly in the times we find ourselves in when there's all kinds of global stressors. There's, of course, a lot of political divide. And it's amazing how simple and how profound that is. I love the idea of asking patients that at the end of life. I have to tell you, I asked many, many, many people to do it. I've only gotten three letters back. And the one I got from Jim was uh, just the one letter. The only letter said, Dear Marty, because his wife found it. He had never actually written it, but I knew that already. Yeah. And then I lost one from one of my other patients who was just one of the greatest human beings ever, Governor Albert Brewer. Uh, He was governor from 69 to 71 and took care of him for the last eight years of his life. And as a enormous human being, just just a wonderful person, his message was, it was in a three-page letter, so I can't say it. I don't have it all memorized as the one sentence. But it was, the important thing for him was, it's all about the relationship. And it's about the relationship you have with your patients, with your colleagues, with the people who um, answer the phone, with the people above you, below you, beside you. And that's what enriches life. And so I just try to keep that in mind with the patients too. 
just like you do, I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what was the third? He was a uh, fella who had pancreatic cancer and flew to New York and flew back, was told he was um, had about six months to live. We did his operation. He um, lived for two more years, saw all his grandchildren be born. And for him, it was uh, recognizing the balance. Don't ignore your family while you're trying to work through your aspirations because, again, it's the balancing the focus on your life and uh, make sure you remember the other pieces of it because we, you know, in, in surgery and academic medicine, we all try to be everything to everybody. And, you know, are you a funded investigator, an artful administrator, a busy surgeon, a uh, family person, and then an educator? I don't know. I mean, that's pretty all hard to do. All right. of the <laughs> It's very hard. It is very hard. And as your patient said, really that balance and um, remembering your family and those relationships are, are so pivotal. Our conversation is supposed to steer towards the future of cancer and cancer medicine. Um, I have to start this conversation with a story of my own family. My dad, when I went to medical school, said, do make sure that you're, you don't do cancer because we're going to have that solved in like five years. So <laughs> there's no future in it. Um, and at the time, I never saw myself as a as a cancer doctor. I was interested in women's health and then ultimately found this path of GYN oncology. But I guess, you know, it seems kind of silly to think 20 years ago, 25 years ago, that we really thought we would have cured cancer by now. And yet when I think about everything that we've accomplished in the last 25 years, we cure a lot more cancer now than we did then. So it's really hard to picture what the next 25 years will be like. So obviously you're really young because you said we started the war on cancer in uh, 25 years ago. It was Richard Nixon who started the war on cancer in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And so it's about 50 years ago. Either way, it's been a long time. And, you know, we facetiously used to say the war, you know, the cure for cancer is around the corner and it always will be. And yes. so that was yeah. the challenge. That's what your dad was really saying. But we have the understanding around cancer, I think, centered around two things. One, that cancer is a multitude of cells in your body. For every different type of cell in your body, there are different types of cancer. And so to say, that to cure cancer as a single swipe of the sword won't happen because different cells have different reasons they develop their go haywire. And so we won't ever be able to do that in a single one. And therefore, reorganizing ourselves and our expectations and managing our expectations to say, we're going to start taking care of the big ones. And then we're going to work towards the ones that may be a little bit more rare because those are the ones that affect the most people. So I think that's number one. I think number two is understanding the biology of cancer such that the relationship between the abnormal cells and your body, because what I think people fail to recognize is that cancer is part of yourself. And I know you were saying earlier that we had something about, yeah, our body betrayed us on a previous podcast. And betrayal is such a fickle thing, you know, to assign it to a cell. But anyway... It's an emotion that I'm not sure you can assign to a cell. But anyway, when you get uh, betrayed, if you will, it's because your body fails to recognize that that cell is not part of yourself because your body takes care of cancer cells every single day of your life. Right. And figuring that out and how to get your body to recognize that and have your immune system to be the best it can be. Now, I would just like to say open parentheses, don't go to the GNC and buy thousands of dollars of stuff. Worth of immune preventing <laughs> or immune boosting materials. Right, your immune health. Now, with no disrespect to the GNC, I know this is going to be out there. I love the GNC. But just don't go buy all the immune boosting stuff. Close parentheses. Yes. So I think we hear a lot about immune boosting with the COVID outbreak and the things that um, have been recommended as part of being healthy to avoid COVID. When we think about that, I think we really think about the basics, you know, and in cancer prevention, those basics include the stuff that we talk about all the time, eating a healthy, balanced diet, 
exercise, getting enough sleep, even the lowering of stress and how stress plays into the immune system, all those things that aren't found in the GNC. Jennifer, none of those things are sexy. I know. I know. That is the hard part. Let's think about that. Heslin's diet book is only one sentence long. (laughs) Do tell. And I can't sell it. I can't put it like Heslin's magic diet. It's to burn off more than you take in. See, even that is now on the chopping block. The calorie balance is is no longer. But at the end of the day, if you want to lose weight, you have to burn off more than you take in. Now, you can move it around during the day. You can take longer periods of fasting. I get all that. But at the end of the day, in a 24-hour period, you will lose weight if you burn off more than you take in. Well, getting away from weight (laughs) and um, moving to kind of, I think of the future of cancer in the the three major buckets, one being, of course, kind of the cancer prevention bucket, and then there's the cancer treatment bucket, the kind of early curable treatments and, and how we go about doing that. And then there's the whole other bucket that is the kind of, as you were saying, from taking it from the moment of diagnosis to live as long as possible and as well as possible. If we take the last bucket first, where do you see the treatment of, shall we say, incurable cancer headed in the next 25 years? 25, that's beyond my professional career, but I'll uh, speculate on what it might have. And I think it's understanding the further details of the mechanisms of cancer and then how we can alter those mechanisms on the fly, right? You know, because it's the idea of like building the plane while you're flying it. Yes. And so at the end of the day, the patient still has to be alive and well and have good quality of life while you're trying to treat their cancer. So I think it is uh, understanding the very specific biologic and uh, molecular defects and how to either replace them or stop them from working so that cancer can become a chronic disease. Right. Because, you know, there are many cancers and trying to, and again, when you talk about operations, you know, there are many cancers that you die with mm-hmm. and not die from. Yes. And that's another really, really important conversation, but it gets back to, again, the biology of cancer the comorbidities of the patient, and, you know, whatever treatment you're going to do. I substitute operation, but, you know, it could be the treatment. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's understanding that biology, and I think that'll be number one. I think the relationship of biology to the the patient's immune system is going to be number two, Mm -hmm. and we are learning so much about the immune system and just how to get the body to recognize that a cell has gone haywire and it needs to be squashed. Mm -hmm. Do you see that being kind of where we're headed or do you think it's going to be very individualized um, to the patient? I think uh, individualization is going to be probably more in the future than it is now because you think about it when we treat, you know, we do a big operation on somebody and they have like a 70% recurrence rate or you do chemotherapy and they say, oh, it's it's much better. We have a 50% response rate and you're thinking, golly. We got to do better than that because we're hurting a whole bunch of people that didn't benefit from it and under the guise of saying we do it safely, which is true. We do perform operations safely. We give chemotherapy safely. But at the end of the day, we treat a whole bunch of people unnecessarily because we don't understand the biology. Right. I think even of the patients with a curable disease that you've had a successful operation, you've removed the cancer entirely for an entire group of people, depending on the, the cells and the diagnosis, we recommend additional treatment with either radiation or chemotherapy, not knowing who are those patients at highest risk for recurrence. Those are the days when I start to feel like a 19th century doctor, that there's so much that we don't know now that we are operating blind to say, you know, we think you have, like you said, you know, a certain percentage risk that this is going to come back. But as one of my professors said to me, to a patient, that's all ones and zeros. It's either 100% coming back or it's a 0% chance of coming back. It's just that we can't tell with our current very limited knowledge which patients that is. 
perfect segue because I do believe that now we treat patients based on organs. And it, admittedly, there are certain mutations and alterations that are more common in different types of cancer. And that's why we have, by trial and error, figured out what operations, what chemotherapy work best in these people. And when we say work best, a certain percentage of people, it's very successful. But I think that our ability to change the paradigm to instead of being colon cancer, your molecular signature is cancer number 157. And actually for cancer number 157, the treatments aren't in any way related to what standard chemotherapy is for colon cancer. Right. And so as we understand that biology, I think our ability to define and personalize therapy will be much greater. And uh, our goal at the Mitchell Cancer Institute is to um, develop those personalized treatments, understand the cancer biology for all the important cancers, and not that any are unimportant, but all the common cancers, Mm -hmm. so that we can then treat people so that they get the, most people get the benefit as opposed to treating people and saying, well, we're not really sure if it's going to work in you. Sure. And we talked also about these integrated teams um, working together. So it's not just surgery, not just chemo, not just radiation, kind of how each of those fit together with the biology of of the patient's personalized tumor. That is correct. And so cancer has become a team sport and our ability to interact with each other is a logistical issue because we, as you and me and every other generation of physician before us, are built in departments that were people that are like each other. Like you have surgeons are like each other and medical oncologists are like each other and radiation oncologists are like each other. Yeah, I actually tell the medical students, wait till you find your pack and that's probably what specialty you're going to go into. That's exactly right. But that's not what the patient wants, right? If we were really doing this and, you know, when we talk about patient reported outcomes, that's just asking the patient what they want, you know, how did it go and what's really important for you. It's like asking people at the end of life, tell me what's important to you. It's an open-ended question. And we can learn a lot from the patients on how to design it better. But I think in the cancer world, it's not magical. It's not magical that a patient would like to talk to their medical oncologist, their surgeon, and radiation oncologist to understand the implications and timing of all those therapies and is it going to benefit them or not. Absolutely. And that's the most simple and straightforward question that what are the pros? What are the cons? What's the likelihood of benefit? I get asked by friends and family all the time, you know, I know this cancer is in your specialty. I'm going to see the cancer doctor tomorrow. What should I ask? And I think it all comes down to that. I just ask him three questions. And this is my, to the people out there in the world listening to this podcast, Always remember just three questions because you can frame it in categorical variables, just yes or no. Are you going to cure me? Yes or no. Are you going to make me live longer? Yes or no. Are you going to make me live better? Yes or no. Because if the answer is no, no, and no, then I'm going to do the best I can for as long as I can. And for as uncomfortable that that will make your family be, that's probably still the right answer. Absolutely. Because we, again, we, when we talk to patients and um, they're in difficult situations and they have a cancer diagnosis and they come to me and say, doc, I want a 1% chance of living. The answer is not a 1% chance of living. It's what's your chance that you are going to be in a nursing home? What's the chance you're going to be in a wheelchair? What's the chance you're not going to be able to share a meal with your family? What's the chance that you're not going to see your grandchildren? And so I think those are the better questions. They're harder, but they're better questions because they help frame it. And again, it takes a little time, but it frames the, that piece of the relationship better if you can answer those three questions. Absolutely. And turning our gears one more time towards the true cancer prevention, the, the patient never gets the cancer diagnosis in the first place. Where do you think we're headed with that? I think it's uh, the basis will be in our genetic profiling. You know, we have a full-time genetic counselor that's on site at the Mitchell Cancer Institute to help us guide patients and families for what we know now. And if you think about what we know now compared to what we knew 25 years ago about the genetics of cancer, it's just exponentially huge change. 
But I think that, um, so the genetics of cancer is number one, because that'll help guide us who to screen more. Because you can't screen every patient every day. Right. We can't afford that. And it's, you know, not good for the patients because we'll, there's complications and consequences of what we do. So we want to focus our screening based on the genetic profiles of the patients and then work on people to lead healthy lifestyles. But again, a healthy lifestyle isn't as sexy as we'd like it to be. And so how do we get to the point of like, you know, calorie restriction? There's a wealth of data out there on calorie restriction and people living longer. But golly, I had like four Snickers bars last night and it was just impossible to stop. I did stop before five and they and they were minis. <laughs> they were snack size. But I get it like everybody else. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, it feels good to lump a big piece of chocolate and peanuts and caramel in your mouth. That is excellent and always good in moderation. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is moderation. And that's, I think you hit it. You hit the nail on the head for for any type of prevention it's a moderation, you know, with your weight, with your, I mean, with your calories, with your changing the paradigm of how much protein and uh, carbohydrate and fat you take in. Sure. And you're the expert on that. Why don't you tell us about that? What's the right answer? Well, I think that um, when you look at the whole piece, I I go back to something that actually we discussed on a, a much earlier podcast with Dr. Israel. I always look at the healthy plate. Um, I have spent a lot of time studying culinary medicine and um, how to not just how to eat healthy and how to feed my family in a healthy way, but how to teach people how to do that. Um, By no means an expert. But if you look at the healthy plate, it is half fruits and vegetables, a small portion of protein. But keep in mind that even your beans, your milk and your dairy all fall into that quarter of protein. And then a healthy, small amount of grains, Um, the more complex, the better. So that's where your carbohydrates fall. And all of that is a very straightforward thing. But I think, as you and I discussed, I think it's so much more than diet. You know, it's movement and getting out there and being physically healthy, being mentally healthy and, and lower stress. And yet... You know, ironically, I was listening to a podcast on the way here that talked about uh, the right amount of stress that we continue to challenge ourselves and and put ourselves in new circumstances and new situations that that give you a healthy balance between that stress. Because if you're always seeking to be even keeled, that that comes with its own anxiety, that something will rock the boat, which, of course, it always does. I have plenty of that. Moving to a new job when you're 59 and taking on all the stressors with that, I certainly took care of that piece of the business. And, I, and I'm happy uh, to do it. And it's, and like I said, it's just the beginning, not the end. I'll look back and at this and make a decision about uh, how it all went. And I think it's going to work out great. The people there are awesome. And I think um, relationships are really important when you talk about prevention and stress reduction. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that having a spouse around makes people live longer. And so I think it's the relationship. You have to have a little bit of healthy stress. And I think the most important thing that I tell people is that the longer you sit on the couch, the longer you sit on the couch. And the problem with that is that you won't build muscle mass. You won't have you know healthy cardiovascular system won't be working. And you need to prepare for whatever's coming. And in the cancer world, it's preparing for whatever is next because we, you know, we want to make sure that we want to do a safe operation or a safe treatment or whatever it is for the cancer piece. But circling back to the prevention piece, I think it is managing, you know, all those aspects. And I, and I would just reemphasize what you said about it isn't just healthy eating. There's all the other aspects of it that are helpful. And I think it's um, helping people to get past the fire, shelter, and then food when you talk about your basics of what you're, you know, you need to get past some of those things. And that's where I think our social programs need to help out. But once you get past that, then you talk about all the other important things. Absolutely. Well, we are lucky and delighted to have you at the Mitchell Cancer Institute. And we're really excited about the future of what that holds. I can't thank everybody enough for welcoming me to the city and to the Mitchell Cancer Institute. It's been humbling to see how many people 
are really appreciative, and I hope that we'll be able to give that back to everybody, not only at the Mitchell Cancer Institute, but in the city and the community at large. Thank you. I really enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Heslin today about the future of cancer care in terms of what we're learning about genetics and what we're learning about how we can prevent cancer with diet and exercise. But another big takeaway for me is how to be patient-centered in our practice and how important for patients, crucial really, to have relationships that can sustain us. That wraps up episode 22 of The Cancering Show. Next, we'll talk with an incredibly inspirational leukemia survivor about how running marathons during his treatment and writing a memoir about it helped him get through it all. Thanks, everyone, for listening to The Cancering Show with JYP, Dr. Jennifer Young-Pierce. Please subscribe, rate, and review this show on iTunes and anywhere else you listen to your favorite podcasts. Want us to deliver The Cancering Show to your email inbox? Contact us at cancering.com and we can make sure you never miss an episode. We would love to know what you think about the show or if you have any suggestions on topics you would like to hear. You can reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, and cancering.com. Till next time, be healthy, happy, and always thriving. This show is brought to you by the University of South Alabama Mitchell Cancer Institute. MCI is a cutting-edge cancer research and patient center built to fight cancer smarter in Mobile and Baldwin County, Alabama. Our researchers and clinicians focus daily on the struggle against cancer, serving a potential catchment population of more than 4.1 million people. With a singular focus of advancing cancer diagnosis, treatment, and prevention throughout the Gulf Coast and beyond with science, technology, and hope. Want to know more about the Mitchell Cancer Institute? Visit us at usamci.com or search for us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Mitchell Cancer Institute is a member of USA Health. To learn more about all of our hospitals, clinics, and services, visit usahealthsystem.com.